Would you take your Bibles this morning, and I want you to open to the Old Testament book of Ruth, Ruth chapter number one. That's going to be our passage today, Ruth chapter one, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Ruth. I'm just kidding. It's a little bit farther along than that. Go a few more books to the right, and you'll come to the book of Ruth chapter 1, and we're going to start at verse 16. Would you stand for the reading of God's word? We're going to look at verse 16, Ruth chapter 1. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee, for whither thou goest I will go, and whither thou lodgest I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest will I die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. Thank you. You may be seated. This is God's eternal word. May we learn from it today. May we be submissive to what he tells us. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for... Your word, thank you for how you constantly are teaching us and sanctifying us into the image of Christ through the truth of Scripture. Lord, I pray you'll continue that as we look at this passage here today, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this is Mother's Day, a day that we set aside to give honor to whom honor is due. We know that the world does not place a high value on motherhood. To some, mothers are a second-class citizens of society. Recently, a Hollywood actress, Michelle Williams, won a Golden Globe Award, and in her speech, she celebrated the fact that she had an abortion. And she said in her speech that she would never have been able to win that Golden Globe Award if she chose to be a mother and if she chose to have that child. So she was celebrating the fact that she chose to have an abortion. Her narcissistic speech not only illustrates the depravity of our day, but it's one of the most evil things I've ever heard. Sacrificing our children to pursue our dreams does not exalt womanhood. The Bible is clear that womanhood, one of God's greatest gifts to humanity, is exalted through motherhood. There's no Golden Globe trophy or anything that can compare to being a mother. And so it's fitting that we celebrate and honor mothers because the world certainly doesn't do it. And the Bible speaks very clearly on this issue. The Bible says in Exodus 20, verse 12, honor thy father and thy mother. In Leviticus 20, verse 9, for everyone that curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. God's pretty serious about honoring your parents. So much so that he made this capital punishment crime in Israel. If you were an Israelite living back in that day, you took your life into your hands by cursing your mother or father. Proverbs 1.8 says, And forsake not the law of thy mother. Proverbs 15.20 says, But a foolish man despises his mother. And Proverbs 23 verse 22 says that despise not thy mother when she is old. So I want us to look at a passage of Scripture today that I think will help us in honoring our mother. And this is the story of Ruth. Ruth has been called one of the greatest pieces of literature ever written. It's a beautiful story. It's a story of how a pagan girl named Ruth came to be part of the covenant people of Israel. This is one of two books in the Bible that have a woman's name on it. The other is Esther. Esther brought salvation to the Jewish race by standing for her people at a crucial time. And Ruth is honored and exalted in the Bible because of several reasons. First of all, she's the grandmother of King David. So she figures prominently into the plan of redemption. If there were no Ruth, there would be no King David. If there was no King David, there would be no Messiah. So this is the story of how she became the grandmother of King David And later, she's mentioned in the genealogy of Christ. She's only one of four women that are mentioned in the genealogy of our Lord Jesus. But secondly, she's an example of a virtuous woman. In Ruth 3.11, it calls her virtuous. 
You know, what's interesting is in the Hebrew Bible, the book that follows um, Proverbs is not Ecclesiastes. In our English Bible, Ecclesiastes follows Proverbs. But in the Hebrew Bible, you know what book follows Proverbs? The book of Ruth. And think about the last chapter in Proverbs. It's chapter what? 31, right? Proverbs 31. Ever hear of a Proverbs 31 woman? Because that whole chapter is describing a virtuous woman. And it starts out asking the question, who can find a virtuous woman? And then it gives a description of what she's like. And then it's almost like God said, if you want to know what a virtuous woman is like, here's the next book. Here's Ruth. Right beside Proverbs 31. And she acts out being a virtuous woman. And one of the things we notice about Ruth is that she knew how to honor her mother. She knew how to love her mother. In this case, it was her mother-in-law, but it's the same principle. One of the key characters in the story is a, a woman by the name of Naomi. Ruth married Naomi's son, and later he died. Ruth then became the caretaker of Naomi. And as we look at this story, we see a beautiful relationship between Ruth and and Naomi, and we see how Ruth honored her. And so I want us to learn from this. There are four ways we can honor our mother that we can learn from this passage. And here's the first one. Number one, be mindful of her burdens. We see in this story that Naomi carried some heavy burdens. Naomi is the mother in this story who carried many burdens, not unlike our mothers. Many of us can remember our moms carrying burdens in our life. They persevered through many trials through many sorrows. And you know what? We should honor them for that. We should remember the burdens that they carried. Let's look at some of the burdens that Naomi had. First of all, she lived in a difficult time. Look in chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in those days when the judges rule. What time was she living in? The time of the judges. If you know anything about the history of Israel, the time of the judges was a very dark time. This was the dark ages for Israel one of the lowest points in their history. It was a divided nation. They were constantly at war. One tribe was almost wiped out by another. They were constantly being defeated by all of the nations around them because they weren't obeying the Lord. This is a period of moral decline. The people are engaged in idolatry. In fact, some of the most shocking stories in the Old Testament come from the book of Judges. Women are getting abused and raped. Homosexuality is rampant. A Levite priest leads a whole tribe into idolatry, and later that priest's name is revealed, and he's the grandson of Moses. Just one generation removed from Moses, his grandson is leading them into idolatry. Morality is turned upside down. Israel has become Sodom and Gomorrah. And if you're in Ruth chapter 1, look, look up at the top. You might see the last verse in the book of Judges verse 25 of chapter 21, where it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was, what? Right in his own eyes. And so it was a time of moral relativism. Everybody doing what they think is right. Does that sound familiar? We're living in those kind of days today. It's a challenge for a mother to mother her children in dark days like that and this. But many of the moms that we honor were moms who had, were very faithful and godly during difficult times. So she lived in an ungodly era. She bore heavy financial hardship. Look again in chapter 1. Now it came to pass in those days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. This was not uncommon in the ancient Near East. People would go through times of famine and poverty and financial hardship. Uh, many of us can remember, perhaps growing up, and there were times of poverty in our life, and yet it almost seemed like our mothers were able to take care of us even through those scarce times, even through those difficult times. Moms seem to have a gift for making a dollar go a long way. It's like the guy who uh, came to knock on a man's door, and the man answered the door, and he said, you know, the people in Korea need our help. If you just give one dollar, Kim Soo can feed his wife and 12 kids. They can have rice for a whole year. And the kids can get books and pencils. And Kim Soo can also buy a boat where he can fish. And he can put all four of his children through college. And the man said, I'd be happy to give Kim Soo a dollar if he'll just come here and show my wife how to stretch a dollar that much. Moms seem to already know how to do that. Seems like they always have the ability to 
keep us fed and put things on the table when we were growing up. She lived in a difficult era. She bore financial hardship. She supported her husband. Look at verse 2. And, and the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. Here we're introduced to the family. Here's the husband. Elimelech is his name. His name actually means, my, God is my king. Naomi's name means pleasantness. And they had two sons in verse number 2, Malon and Chilion. Malon means puny or sickly. Chilion means pining or vanishing. Going by their names, they weren't exactly physical specimens. But this family gets out of the will of God. Naomi had a husband who was not following the Lord as he should. And there are some mothers that have had to bear that burden, where they're perhaps married to a man who's not really following the Lord. You see, Elimelech, he made a wrong decision. And he suffered for it. In fact, his whole family suffered for it. You know, our decisions affect those around us. What does Elimelech do? Look in verse number two at the end. It says, that, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. In response to the famine, he decided to move out of the promised land and move into Moab. He basically started running from his troubles. Warren Worsby said it like this, when trouble comes to our lives, we can do one of three things. We can endure it, we can escape it, or enlist it. If we endure our trials, our trials become our masters, and we have the tendency to become hard and bitter. If we try to escape our trials, we'll miss God's purpose. But if we enlist our trials, then our trials will be our servants, not our masters, and we'll know what God is doing, and all things will work together for good. Here, Elimelech, he's running, and he makes a bad decision. What was the, why was his decision so bad? Well, he walked by sight and not by faith. We sometimes do the same thing. We're judging by our feeble sense rather than trusting in the Lord. Instead of trusting in God through the famine, he devises his own plan, and he gets out of the promised land. Abraham did this once. He ran down to Egypt during a time of famine. He didn't ask God about it. But then he also majored on the physical, not on the spiritual. He's more concerned about bread on the table. Of course, every father or husband is, wants to provide for his family. But we must never do it at the expense of losing the blessing of God. We have to trust God. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And what? All these things will be added unto you. God promised to take care of us if we focus on him. But Elimelech wasn't thinking that way. He just left the promised land, the place of blessing, the place that the tabernacle was located, the place of God's presence. And he ran down to Moab. And this is the other thing he did. Instead of honoring the Lord, really, he honors his enemy. Instead of trusting in the Lord, he runs down to the enemy. Why would you do that? Moab, were the, the Moabites were the enemies of God. They, were, they, they treated Israel terribly when Israel was trying to come into the promised land. They tried to put a curse on the Israelites. And so this was the enemies of God. And here is Elimelech running down to the enemies of God's people rather than trusting in the Lord. His name might mean God is my king, but he's certainly not living like God is his king. But then the other thing was he became a permanent resident there. That was never his real intention. Because if you look in verse 1 at the word sojourn, it's a, the Hebrew word it means just to, to be a, a, an alien in a land. He, he only meant to stay there for a short time, but he ended up staying there for 10 years. And they were not good years. It's safe to say that Naomi suffered because of her husband's decisions. Yet in spite of that, she remained faithful. She remained supportive. You know, as men, we have to be careful that we walk with God, don't we? But here's the next thing. She lived at a difficult time. She bore financial hardship. She supported her husband. She persevered through sorrow. Look at verse 3. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. Now she becomes a widow. It's very hard for women to be widows in this day. There were no government programs to take care of them. Help had to come from the family. But she did have two sons. And look at verse number Four, it says, when she was left to these two sons, verse 4, and they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelt there about 10 years. At least she has two sons that can take care of her. 
But tragedy comes again, look in verse 5, and Malon and Chilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. So here she has to bear terrible heartache, terrible sorrow. Again, we think of our, some moms that may be here today, and you've had to persevere through terrible heartaches and burdens and sorrows. No one knows the pain of losing a child like a parent that has been through that. And here she loses two of her sons, and she feels the pain of emptiness. In fact, she says that in verse 21, when she's commenting on that, she says, I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. When, she, when I left Bethlehem and went to Moab, I was full, but now I'm coming back, and now I'm empty. She feels emptiness. This is one of the themes of the book, and that is how God will replace that emptiness with his fullness. He will do this for Naomi as we go along, and he'll do this for you too if you're empty. God is a God who fills our emptiness, but she's reflecting on this time. Again, I think one of the ways we honor our mothers is by remembering how they persevered through the burdens of life, and they persevered through the sorrows of life. Many of our mothers have had to endure, and we thank God that they did. Um, our brother David Johnson is here this morning. His mother passed away on Friday. I remember when I was just, I got there right at the time that she passed and prayed with David, and David began to remind me of how she persevered through difficulty, and she bore many burdens. She sacrificed to put him and his brother through a Christian school. No mother could have a more loving and dutiful son than David. And he was honoring her by remembering her perseverance. Be mindful of her burdens. But here's number two. Be thankful for her sacrifices. Look down at verse 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that they might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Now Naomi hears that God is blessing Bethlehem. God is intervening on behalf of his people. The famine is over. And it seems like the best thing for a poor widow to do is to go back home to Israel. So she decides to return. So look at verse number seven. Wherefore, she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, go and return each to her mother's house. The Lord dealt kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. So they're beginning their journey back to Bethlehem. And Naomi turns to her two daughters-in-law and she says, you know what? You need to go back to your home. She's telling them to go home. She's telling them, don't come with me. Now, why would she do that? Most commentators say that Naomi is selfish. She's wrong in telling them to go back. She, uh, most commentators say the reason she's doing this is because she didn't want the embarrassment of people seeing her that she had Moabite daughters-in-law. So she's trying to cover up her family's disobedience. That's what a lot of people say on this. I disagree. I see the opposite. She was sending them back because she thought it was better for them, not for her. When she says in verse 8, return to your mother's house, she's releasing them to remarry. She's saying it's better for you to go back to your homeland. You can start your life again. You can remarry. I can't do anything else for you. Look, look what she says um, in verse number uh, 9. The Lord grant, or excuse me, verse 8. And Naomi said unto her two daughters, and I'll go and return each to her mother's house. And the Lord deal kindly with you. You've been good to me. I pray God is good to you. Look at verse 9. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice, and they wept. The word rest there in verse 9 is a key word, manua. May you find peace and security and happiness. I can't give you this. But if you go back and you find a husband and you restart your life, you can surely find rest. She wants to spare them restlessness and wandering. And so she's really putting them ahead of her own needs. And that's really the heart of a mother, isn't it? Think about all the sacrifices that a mother makes for her children. And here again, we're reminded of a mother's heart. She's constantly putting others, mainly her children, 
in front of her, and she's willing even to give her life for her children. On August the 16th, 1987, a Northwest Airlines Flight 225 crashed just after it had taken off at a Detroit airport. It killed 155 people. There was only one survivor on that plane. It was a little four-year-old girl named Cecilia. When the rescuers found Cecilia, they couldn't believe that she was even on the plane. They thought that maybe she was uh, a child that was there, one of the children that was from the highway. They plainly crashed into a highway, and there were some cars that were there. They thought that maybe she was a child from one of the cars there on the highway. But when they checked the passenger manifest, sure enough, her name was on there. And they found out what had happened was that when the plane was going down, Cecilia's mother unbuckled her seatbelt, and she, on her knees, got in front of her in front of her seat, and she absolutely covered her daughter with her body and protected her during that whole crash. And the mother died, but the child didn't have a scratch on her. That's the heart of a mother, giving her life for her children. So be mindful of her burdens. Be thankful for her sacrifices. But here's number three, be loyal in her later years. You know, it's very easy in this life to get so caught up with our purpose, our mission, our things that we want to do, that we forget our mothers in her later years. Sadly, there are those that treat their mother as an inconvenience and a burden when they're elderly. But notice what happens here in verse number 10. And they said unto her, surely we will return with thee unto thy people. Here is Ruth and Orpah, and they're determined to stay with Naomi. They say, we're going to stay with you. We're going to return with you. And then here Naomi gives them a speech, a long speech. This can be divided up into three parts, but she's basically persuading them, go back. Look in verse 11. And Naomi said, turn again, my daughters. Look at verse 12. Turn again, my daughters. And then in the middle of verse 13, where it says, nay, my daughters. In essence, she's saying, go back. I can't really help you. Look at verse 11. Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? I can't have any more children. I'm too old for that. Verse 12, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would you tarry for them till they are grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters. She says, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. She says, there's no advantage for you two to stay with me. I mean, if I were able to get married and have children, would you wait until they were grown till you married them? There's, of course not. And so she says, I can't help you. You need to move on. But then look at verse 14. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And here we see the loyalty of Ruth to Naomi. Orpah kissed her goodbye, but Ruth, she clings to her. Now, up until this point, Ruth and Orpah have been equals, but the narrator's purpose here is to show the superiority of Ruth at this point. She shows her virtue in an an incredible way. She cleaves to Naomi. She's not going to let her go. Now, the writer doesn't present Orpah in a negative way. He just simply shows how Ruth... Her virtue is greater. One writer says this, Orpah pursues the natural course. Ruth is determined to swim upstream. She goes the extra mile for her mother. And look at verse 15. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is going back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Look, Ruth, Orpah's returned back. You do the same thing. And now it's Ruth's turn to give a speech. And she gives that speech, and this was the passage that we read just a moment ago. And this is one of the great passages in the Old Testament. In fact, these words have become very famous words. And you hear these words quoted at weddings as part of wedding vows. You've probably heard this. They've also been hijacked by politicians and used in their speeches. You should love how politicians will hijack verses out of the Bible, yet they won't support it. Look at verse 16. And Ruth said, 
Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. And thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. And where thou diest, will I die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do also to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And so here she locks her future in with Naomi. No, I'm going wherever you go. She confesses allegiance to the people of Israel. Your people will be my people. She confesses allegiance to Israel's God. Your God will be my God. She makes a complete break with everything in her past. Refuses to go back. And in this, she kind of is like Abraham. Remember Abraham? He left his homeland. He left the idols behind. And he began to follow the true and living God. This is exactly what Ruth is doing. Abraham did it when God gave him a promise. Ruth is doing it even though her mother-in-law is trying to talk her out of it. She shows even greater faith. And the fact that she's even willing to give an oath and to call upon God's name. You know what that reveals? That this isn't just a decision to be committed to her mother. This is also a decision to be committed to God. This is really her conversion here. She had evidently learned enough about the God of Israel, Naomi's God, that she now says, He is my God, and I'm going to serve Him. And uh, she leaves all of the gods of the Moabites behind. She's now a believer in the God of Israel. And this will become clear throughout the rest of the book. Of course, we're not going to have time to look at it this morning. But this is one of the key things about Ruth is her faith. And she's committed. It's a beautiful example of salvation because you know what happens when you get saved? You turn away from your past life. You leave it all behind. You're no longer serving idols. You're no longer living in past sin. You're now serving the true God. Paul said this to the Thessalonians. He said, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord. In other words, people are hearing about what you did. For they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had on you, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. Everyone hears about how you have turned away from all those idols, and now you're serving the living and the true God. That's salvation. That's true repentance. That's turning to the Lord. And when Naomi sees her commitment, look at verse 18. She no longer tries to talk her out of it. Verse 18, when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. And you know what? God's going to honor Ruth for this. He's going to honor Ruth for honoring Naomi. Because we see this later in the story. Well, fast forward with me. Go to chapter 2, verse 1. Let me show this to you real quick. And, uh, you know, they get to Bethlehem. What do they need? They need food, right? They came right at the time of, of the barley harvest. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. So here's a wealthy man, Boaz. The Bible says he was a... Uh, Gabor Haish, this is a guy who's of standing. He is a man of valor. He's wealthy. He's strong. He's a man of substance. Look at verse 2. And Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me go into the field and glean after ears of corn, after him whose, whose sight I shall find favor or grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. Ruth says, Let me just go and glean in the field. You know what God did back in the Old Testament? If you were poor, this is how God would help take care of you. If you were a wealthy person and you would glean your fields at harvest, or you would harvest at your fields at harvest time, there were certain parts, corners of the field, and certain places where maybe your your reapers couldn't get it all, and it was left behind. You know what God said? Don't go back into the field the second time and get that. Just leave it there. For who? For the poor. The poor can glean after the reapers are done, and so that was a law. And this is what Ruth is saying. Let me go into the field, somebody's field. I don't know who. Maybe someone will give us grace and we can find favor in someone's eyes. But let me go out and glean in the fields. And Naomi says, go. And look in verse 3. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap, or we could say it like this, it just so happens that she was to light upon the part of the field belonging unto Boaz who is of the kindred of Elimelech. Now, the writer here is kind of being a little tongue-in-cheek. You know, it just so happens that she happened to glean 
in the field of Boaz, that wasn't an accident. That was the providence of God that she was there at that time. She gleans in his field. And look at his responses. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, verse 4, came to the reapers, said, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. In verse 5, Then Boaz said unto his servants that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? Who is that? In the field there. I've never seen her before around here. And the rest is history, as they say. Because what happens? Well, he marries her. And it's a long story in here, but I just wanted to show you what's, what's the, really the, the thing that we learn here. And by the way, I love it to where it says, it'll say this later on. He, he goes to her and he says, look, don't reap in any other fields. You just stay in this field. Don't go anywhere else. No need to go anywhere else. He kind of gives her handfuls on purpose. He tells the reapers, leave a little more behind for her. And he shows kindness, same word, kesed. Ruth showed kesed kindness unto Naomi. And now here is Boaz showing kesed kindness unto Ruth. So what's the lesson? You reap what you sow, right? Ruth showed grace and loyalty and love to Naomi. And how is God blessing her? With Boaz showing grace and love and loyalty to her. God blesses her, and she ends up marrying Boaz, and she becomes a grandmother of King David, and later she's in the genealogy of Christ. You know what this all tells me, beloved? God honors those who honor their mothers. He honors those who honor their mothers. Let me give you the last thing here real quick. The last principle would be this. Be patient with her faults. Be mindful of her burdens. Be thankful for her sacrifices. Be loyal in her later years. Be patient with her faults. Because as we look at this, you know, Naomi, she's not perfect. No mother is perfect. And when, look, go back to verse 19 of chapter 1, because when they finally make their journey and they come to Bethlehem, look at verse 19. So they two went until they came to Bethlehem, and it came to pass that when they were come to Bethlehem, that all the city was moved about them, and they said, is this Naomi? So when she finally makes the journey back, by the way, it's a long, arduous journey, probably 10 days, had to go over a big mountain, cross the Jordan River, hostile land. She finally makes it back. She goes, she's walking into the town of Bethlehem. And the people who remember her, remember when she left 10 years earlier, see her come back. And they're asking this question, is this the same? Is this Naomi? Is it possible that this is Naomi? Can it be? The years have been hard on her. And people could see it. And Naomi's response, look at verse 20. And she said unto them, call me not Naomi, call me Myra. For the Almighty had dealt very bitterly with me. There's a play on words. Naomi means pleasant. Myra means bitter. Don't call me Naomi pleasant. Call me Myra bitter because God has dealt bitterly with me. And there's a sense in which you can sense a little bit of bitterness in her towards God because of all that she's had to go through. Her faith wasn't perfect. It was flawed. I mean, she lived in Moab for all that time. And so... There's a sense in which she's struggling with the Lord. Her faith is a little weak. But you know what? Ruth doesn't stand in judgment on her or anything like that. She just loves her. And in fact, Ruth's faith in God ends up inspiring Naomi. She begins to have her faith restored in the living God because she begins to see what God is doing through Ruth. And the emptiness that she had coming back, God begins to fill it through the blessings of Ruth in her life and other things. So the lesson of, that, of this is really simple for me. You know what? It's not God didn't call us to point out the flaws and weaknesses of our parents or our mothers. They're not perfect. But you know what? Our lives can encourage them if we live in true faith. Our job is not to look down or judge. Our job is to honor them and love them just like Ruth does here.
Your job is to encourage your mother with your faith. So how do we honor our mother? Be mindful of her burdens. Be thankful for her sacrifices. Be loyal in her later years. Be patient with her faults. And if you're here today and you say, I can relate to Naomi, my life is empty. Well, you can learn from Ruth how to replace that emptiness with fullness. How do you do it? You do it the way Ruth did. What did she do? She put her full faith in God. Her full faith. She turned to God. She clave unto the Lord. Let me just show you this one verse in closing. Go back to verse 6 where it says that at the end, how the Lord had visited his people and giving them bread. This is kind of prophetic. Here's Bethlehem. God visits Bethlehem by sending them bread. But this speaks of many years later when God, a thousand years later, God will visit Bethlehem again, and then he will give them bread, but he'll give them the bread of life, Jesus, who will be born there. Jesus is the bread of life. He has the power to turn emptiness into fullness. He's the true bread from heaven. The whole book of Ruth points to Jesus as the one who gives us that fullness, as the one who gives us that satisfaction. We're living in a day today where it's like the book of Judges, where everyone's doing right in their own eyes. And I want to tell you something, friend. The only way we're going to make it is to have Jesus. Jesus be our fullness. Let's bow for prayer together today. Father, we thank you for this beautiful narrative. There's so much in it. I feel like we just kind of scratched the surface a little. Maybe not even that. So much beauty in this story. So much we can learn from it. But help us, Lord, indeed to learn that you expect us to honor our mothers. To be thankful for them. And again, I know there are some here that their mother is no longer with them. And I pray for great grace, comfort. But we can still honor our mothers even though they're not here by how we live our life. We can carry on the legacy that was left and go even beyond that. And by doing so, honor them. And in doing so, Lord, ultimately we honor you, which is our highest goal. The thing that we want to do more than anything is glorify you and honor you. And there may be some people here, Lord, their lives are empty. They feel the emptiness of this world. They've been through so many burdens and sorrows. And like Naomi, they they feel a, a bitterness because of the hardships of life. I pray, Lord, that they will learn that you are the way, the path to fullness and to have rest and to have peace and satisfaction. It comes through Christ. And if there's someone here today that's never trusted Christ, may they reach out in faith. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, beloved, if you're here and that's your condition, and you want the emptiness to be replaced with rest and fullness, would you come to Christ today? Would you reach out and pray in faith? And say, Lord Jesus, would you fill my empty heart? Would you please be my Savior, be my Lord? Like Ruth, I turn away from the idols of my past life. I turn from the sins of my past life, and I come in repentance, and I call you my Lord and my God. And if you'll pray that and mean it, he will save you, cleanse you, He will adopt you as his own child and you'll have eternal life in heaven. It's the best decision you could ever make. Pray that and mean it. And let us know, friend. We want to encourage you along. Father, bless again your word to hearing hearts, we pray in Jesus' name.